man, it's the, uh, it's that, uh, that quarantine wait. All right, y'all, good morning. Welcome, I'd like to welcome you all to the house of the Lord. We are uh, so glad to see everyone. Um, we're short a couple of families, as you can tell. Um, if y'all can be in prayer for Pastor Ricky and his family, they're quarantining. He was diagnosed with the coronavirus uh, this past week, and so they're uh, dealing with that. He's, I would say he's on the downturn of it at this point. Thankfully, he was able to get some stuff and uh, kind of see turn a corner yesterday, so he's thankful for everyone's prayers and, and all that, but y'all, if, if y'all can continue uh, praying for him and his family, as well as the Galbraith family, I think they were sick as well. I'm not sure if we have any other families that are sick off of hand, but... Uh, yes, we will start our time of worship this morning with a reading from our confession. We have it printed up in here. This is the 1689 London Baptist Confession of Faith. Uh, this is just the confession that our church uh, subscribes to. Basically, it's a culmination of what we believe the Bible teaches to be true about Scripture. It is not authoritative in and of itself. That's the Bible. This is just a, an easier way to kind of compact the things that we know to be true about Scripture. Uh, we handed these out a while back. We have some more copies if anybody would like one. But we are reading paragraph at a time. Each chapter has multiple paragraphs, and uh, we're just kind of going through these one at a time, trying to re-familiarize ourselves with it and familiarize those uh, who are hearing it for the first time. So we are in chapter one concerning the Holy Scriptures, and we are in paragraph eight, and it reads as follows. The Old Testament was written in Hebrew, the native language of the ancient people of God. The New Testament was written in Greek, which at the time it was written was most widely known to the nations. These testaments were inspired directly by God and by his unique care and providence were kept pure down through the ages. They are therefore true and authoritative so that in all religious controversies, the church must make their ultimate appeal to them. All God's people have a right to and a claim on the scriptures and are commanded in the fear of God to read and search them. Not all of God's people know these original languages, so the scriptures are to be translated into the common language of every nation to which they come. In this way, the word of God may dwell richly in all so that they may worship him in an acceptable manner and through patience and the comfort of the scriptures may have hope. All right, if you will, let us go ahead and stand as we begin our time of worship this morning, and we will open with a word of prayer. Let us pray. Dear Only Father, we come to you, Lord, thankful for this day. We thank you for the, the cool weather. Um, we, we thank you for the uh, families that are represented here, the families that are not present, but that are of this household of faith. And uh, most importantly, we're thankful for your son, for without him, we would be lost. We would have nothing. But because of him and because of the works that he has performed um, to your glory and for us, uh, we now have life in his name. So, Lord, we come to you on this day, setting aside our labors, our cares and our worries. And we spend this time uh, essentially to try to worship you as well as we can in spirit and in truth. God, it is by the power of your Holy Spirit that we come together, that we are able to be freed from distractions and offer up uh, our bodies as a living sacrifice to you. So we pray, Lord, in this time we are able to do that. We are not to be and we are able to not be conformed to the ways of this world, but renewed by the um, by your word to be transformed in mind and thought and action so that we can do what uh, pleases you, uh, what is perfect and acceptable. Uh, this is our prayer today, Lord. We pray through song, through prayer, through the preaching of your word, that through all these means we are offering acceptable sacrifice to you, that your people are nourished, are washed in your word, and that um, those that do not know you, that they may come to know you and know that God is in this place. Uh, for those families and those individuals who are watching at home, we pray for them as well, that you allow them to uh, seek and, and find you, that they're able to receive what you have for them, and that uh, we also pray, Lord, for our city, our state, our nation uh, during these um, trials that we are going through. We pray that you enable our leaders to make righteous decisions uh, for those who are in their counsel to uh, seek righteous, um, righteous actions and laws and 
um, words to be uh, spoken in order that we can live a, a peaceable life uh, that pleases you. Or you have given them the sword to wield and they are responsible for that. So it is our duty to pray for them in this fashion. Uh, God, we thank you for all of these things. We pray and ask that you be continue to be faithful as you always have been and allow us to uh, see you in this time. It's in Jesus' name that we pray and give thanks. Amen. Good morning, church family. First Chronicles 29, 11 tells us, Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in the heavens and is earth in, in the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. Let's sing together this morning. Your word alone is solid ground, the mighty rock on which we build. In every line the truth is found And every page with glory filled Through faith alone we come to you We have no merit we can claim Sure that your promises are true we place our hope in Jesus' name. Gloria, Gloria, glory to God alone. Gloria, Gloria, glory to God alone. In Christ alone we're justified His righteousness is all our plea Your laws and man's are satisfied His perfect work has set us free Gloria, Gloria, glory to God alone Gloria, Gloria, glory to God alone. We'll sing by grace. By grace alone we have been saved. All that we are has come from you. Hearts that were once by sin enslaved, now by your power have been made new. Now by your power have been made new. Gloria, Gloria, glory to God alone. Gloria, glory. Glory to God alone. Glory, glory, glory to God alone. Glory, glory, glory to God For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly into the throne of grace, that we may attain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Before the throne of God above, have a strong and perfect plea, great high priest whose name is love, 
Whoever lives and pleads for me My name is graven on his hands My name is written on his heart I know that while in heaven he stands No tongue can bid me thence depart No tongue can bid me thence depart When Satan tempts me to despair And tells me of the guilt within Upward I look and see him there who made an end to all my sin Because the sin the Savior died My sinful soul is counted free For God the just is satisfied Look on Him and pardon me to look on him and pardon me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the one risen Son of God. Behold him there, the risen Lamb, my perfect spotless righteousness, the great unchangeable I am, the King of glory and of grace, one with himself, I cannot die, my soul is purchased by his blood my life is hid with Christ on high with Christ my Savior and my God with Christ my Savior and my God come on let your voice this morning hallelujah Romans 3, verse 23 and 24 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Jesus Christ. Sing all is 
is mine, yet not I, but through Christ in me. The night is dark, but I am not forsaken, for by my side the Savior He will stay. We are in John chapter 19 today. John chapter 19. Our passage is found in verses 38 through 42. Uh, if you don't have a Bible, we have the seat back, uh, the Bibles in the seat backs in front of you. If I'm not mistaken, it's found on page 906. Should be there. Uh, if it's not, it's going to be 907, but it's right there. So John chapter 9. Uh, 19, excuse me, John chapter 19, verses 38 through 42 is our passage for today. See some people still typing it in their phones and some people turning pages. So I'll give y'all just a second before we read it. All right. 
John 19, verses 38 through 42 is our passage for today. Let's go ahead and read it. It says this, After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly, for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him permission. So he came and took away his body. Nicodemus also, who earlier had come to Jesus by night, came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds in weight. So they took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen cloths and uh, with spices, as is the burial custom of the Jews. Now in the place where, the, where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb, in which no one had yet been laid. So because of the Jewish day of preparation, since the tomb was close at hand, they laid, Jesus's, or they laid Jesus there. That is the word of the Lord. May the Lord bless the reading and the hearing of his word. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you, Lord, and we are thankful for this day that you have given us. It is a day that you have made, so we will rejoice and be glad in it. It is our prayer that through this time, uh, as we preach your word, that you are exalted, that you are made much of, that we are lessened, and that we uh, are sanctified further through your word, and in our lives that we are to live uh, before you. Uh, Lord, may idols be crushed, may our hearts be broken if needed, may blind spots be uh, brought to light, Uh, may we be ministered in whatever way you see fit. It is you and your word, uh, it is you through your word that does not return void, uh, but it, it does what it is sent out to do, it accomplishes all that it's sent out to do, it'll be fruitful where it's intended to be fruitful, so that we stand upon that promise, giving All praise, glory, and honor to you in this time, and it's in your son Jesus' name that we pray and give thanks for it. Amen. All right, so this is my third time preaching this month in John 19. Uh, We've had, I guess this is the fifth sermon in John 19 alone. We're just slowly making our way through the book of John, and as I said the first time I preached on the 10th, and then I probably said it on the 17th. I'm going to continue beating this drum because it bears repeating. But it is important for us to understand the intent of John's gospel. The reason he wrote this gospel is very important for us to remember uh, as we read through his letter, because that's the intent that he had for this letter. And this is found for us in chapter 20, verses 30 and 31. So I want to read those verses just to refresh your memory as to the intent of this gospel account. It says, Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. That by believing you may have life in his name. Now, as we think about that and and what we're reading today, I I don't want us to do a Bible drill exercise, but I want to connect some dots because I do feel this is helpful for us to understand our passage today. John tells us there in in John chapter 20 that if we believe Jesus is the Christ, we will have life. Paul tells us in his writings that to truly live is Christ. Jesus told us back in John 10 that he came to give life and give it abundantly. David tells us in the Psalms that Christ makes known to us the path of life and that in his presence is fullness of joy. Now, you may ask, why am I saying this? Why am I talking about life uh, when we're talking about the burial of Christ? Well, I think that's very important for us to understand that, to understand these connections that are made in the Bible itself. And as I was doing my study, I came across this quote that I feel like is way more helpful and way more concise and articulate than I could ever be. Uh, And it's found by, or the quote is by Dr. R.C. Sproul. It says this, listen to this, concerning the burial of Christ. It says, the lowest point of Christ's humiliation was his crucifixion on the cross, but that was soon followed by his exaltation in his resurrection and his ascension to the right hand of God. We can easily see the, uh, the strong contrast between humiliation and exaltation But we often overlook the fact that the transition from humiliation to exaltation did not begin at his resurrection, but rather at his burial. So I believe this helps us understand the importance of the burial that we're going to talk about today. And and there's there's far more importance that, that should be placed on it than we typically give it. And I'm not just saying that because I'm preaching this sermon today. Right. Uh, There's scriptural backing for this as well. 
Listen to what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 and 4. He says this concerning well, what we're talking about today. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ Jesus died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with scriptures. So the burial of Christ is of first importance to the Christian. His death, his resurrection, but also his burial. Now, as I've studied this week and in these other sermons, I've mentioned this a couple times. There's just so much jam packed in these verses that, you know, we don't have the time to to cover all of it. I, I do see a benefit in us doing a study specifically on the passion of Christ, which passion is a word that's used from the Latin word for sufferings. Uh, But to do a study of this Passion Week of Christ uh, and seeing all the Old Testament fulfillments that are given from his his arrest all the way to his resurrection, I could see us doing something like that, just pulling all the Old Testament passages that speak to it. I think that would be very, very important for us to do and, and, and very helpful. But for the sake of today, what are we focusing on, right? What is, what is the big idea of, of what we're talking about today? Because we don't have that kind of time. I, I, I don't want to put you all through that today. Uh, we have two main points. We have two main points that we're going to talk about with some sub points within those. After we talk about these two points, I'm hoping that we, as we apply these truths, that you're given some exhortations or some encouragements uh, to, to take this message and, and um, live in light of it. And then also, not only that, that if there are any any among us who are hearing the gospel for the first time, if God has been the one that has granted you ears to hear, that you are also uh, made aware of the forgiveness that is found in Christ Jesus. So that's the idea for, or the, the, the big idea for me today is what I'm seeking to, um, the motive behind what I'm preaching. So what are those two points that we're going to discuss? Well, the first one is in verses 38 through 40, we are going to look at the man who prepared and buried uh, the body of Jesus. Secondly, we're going to look in verses 41 and 42 at the significance of the place where Jesus was buried. Now, those are the two big points that we're going to look at. And um, obviously, that's kind of like information that that we're going to talk about there. Uh, A sermon isn't complete without, you know, a, a charge given. And so what is that charge? Well, I believe a good way to kind of summarize and encapsulate this sermon of what we're talking about today. And I think it piggybacks well off of what David was teaching in our Sunday school lesson, because there was some of the same verses that were used and some of the songs we were singing this morning. I saw a lot of carryover, so that was great. But the, the big idea for us today is, is this, or the ser- sermon summary, let me put it that way. In spite of man's best or worst efforts, God's will will prevail. In spite of God, or in spite of man's best or worst efforts, God's will will prevail. We saw with the Jews, they sought to kill Jesus. Well, that led to his resurrection, right? We see Peter not wanting Jesus to experience that death, and he told him, get behind me, Satan. I'm I'm fulfilling what I'm called to do, right? We see a lot of these things, and we see two examples with uh, Joseph and Nicodemus in our passage today, and we're going to kind of carry that thought, kind of considering uh, what we're going to talk about next week, where we've been in John 19 this whole time. I think this kind of encapsulates all of this as a whole. So let's first look back at uh, or look at verses 38 through 40. For the sake of time, we're not going to read them over, but we're going to look at these verses first and look at these two men's lives. So as we look at these verses, what what do we see about uh, Joseph and and uh, Nicodemus? Well, we see Joseph is requesting the body of Jesus and him and Nicodemus end up preparing uh, Jesus's body for burial. Now, this is the first time that Joseph of Arimathea is mentioned in this gospel. This is the second time that Nicodemus is mentioned. So we're going to ask a couple of questions, right? Now that we read this, we see these guys, where, where are we going with? Well, the first thing I want to know is who are they? Who are these men? What, what, what is, what's the significance of them being mentioned here? But not only that, the other question that pops up is why were they doing this stuff in secret? That's what's mentioned here as well. And then if you're like me and you like fun facts and trivial information, what's up with the burial customs? Like, what, what is that all about, right? So those are the three questions we're going to talk about in these first couple of verses. So let's look at who these men are. Who is Joseph of Arimathea? Who is Nicodemus? Well, let's look at Joseph of Arimathea first. He was a disciple of Jesus, as was stated here. In Mark and Luke's account, we're told that he was a respected member of the council, uh, and he was also a good and righteous man. This is the way that he's described across the, the Gospels. 
He is believed to be fairly wealthy since, according to Matthew's account of, this, uh, of, the, of the burial, he had recently hewn out of or cut out a tomb in this garden that was pre- going to be prepared potentially for him in, in the future. Um, it is also believed that Joseph of Arimathea was numbered among the men mentioned in John chapter 12. I want to read that verse for you concerning these men uh, among the, the council. It says this in John chapter 12. If you want to turn there, you can. John chapter 12, verse 42. This is believed to be describing Joseph of Arimathea in this group that's mentioned here. The verse says this. Nevertheless, many, and this is, let me give you some context. This is when Jesus is going back and forth with the Pharisees, right? That's the context of what's going on here. It says this in verse 42. Nevertheless, many even of the authorities believed in him, but for fear of the Pharisees, they did not confess it so that they would not be put out of the synagogue, right? It is believed, a lot of commentators and scholars believe that Joseph would have been numbered among these that feared uh, the Pharisees, but had believed in Christ. So since Joseph was a member of the council, he was wealthy, well-respected. Uh, the disciples were all fishermen, lowly men, tax collectors, all this and that. It is believed that due to his position that he would have been granted access to an audience with Pilate. If he was just a commoner, he wouldn't have had that. But being a member of the council, he would have been uh, granted access to meet with Pilate as he's done in these verses. Um, and so that's something that we, something else we see uh, from, or what we can gather from this passage here. Uh, now, why did Joseph go to, to Pilate to ask, request the body of Jesus? Well, it was a common practice with these crucifixions because Roman citizens could not be crucified. Only typically it was slaves and, and non-Roman citizens that were crucified. So it was a very gruesome, heinous way of dying. Not only was the scourging, that pastor mentioned a couple weeks ago, the crucifixion was gruesome in and of itself, but typically what they did, they let the bodies sit on the crosses for days on end and let animals kind of eat away at the bodies. After the animals were done, they'd take the bodies down and throw them into the landfill. That was typically the process that was done for people who were crucified. Now, obviously, Joseph and Nicodemus being disciples of Christ did not want this to happen to Jesus' body, and what would grant them this access to do this Well, we believe it to be Joseph being in good standing, going up to Pilate, him verifying that he was dead. We see that in other accounts, but it's almost as if Pilate was trying to get one last, I'm trying to think, I can't even think of the word, but one last uh, knock against the Jews by allowing him to get buried and taken down. And then the thought that Pilate truly didn't believe that he was truly a guilty man, all of this stuff kind of culminates in the idea that Pilate grants access for Jesus to be removed from the cross instead of to be sat up there and ate away and, and rot as a, as a corpse. And so this was kind of the idea, uh, this is the, the thought that, that is kind of held commonly among commentators, is that this was kind of like a final insult to the Jews that who forced his hand to kill Christ. So that's, that's Joseph in a nutshell, right? There's, I'm sure there's been books written about him, but just for the sake of time, this is kind of the idea that we get of the picture of who uh, Joseph of Arimathea is. Now, who is Nicodemus? Well, Nicodemus was a Pharisee, but he was also a disciple. John makes it clear uh, in this passage, in, in, verse, uh, in these verses here, that Nicodemus vi- was the one that ni- uh, visited him by night, that had visited Jesus previously by night. Now, reading that, you can take that one of two ways, right? You can take that as this is kind of like John, you know, po- poking at, at Nicodemus, like we're making an indictment. This is the same guy who was in private all these uh, years ago that when he came to Jesus, or it could be viewed as clarification for who Nicodemus was and, you know, basically given, uh, acknowledging that he was this righteous man who did see Jesus in the past and then is partaking in this, in this, um, in his burial in this time. Now, either way, no, no matter what way you want to view this, I think the important thing to see is that 16 chapters ago, Uh, Nicodemus is searching for truth. He's talking to Jesus by night. He understands he's a good teacher, uh, but he's confounded by Christ and the things that he's that he's told. uh, But he was not left in his ignorance. Right. As he's talking to Jesus and telling him, well, you know, you have to be born again. Well, what does it mean? Am I going to enter my mother's womb again? All of this stuff is going on in this conversation in John chapter three. He's not left there. He's not just told all this information and then not told what to do with it. 
but he was born again. He, he's born again, and he's now partaking in history by being one of the men that's able to bury our Lord. I, I think that's an amazing thing to kind of think of. This guy was just an, another Pharisee, just another guy, and now we have record of him being one of the men that's able to bury our Lord. Now, this leads to the next question, right? This leads to the next question. Now, we have a general idea of who these, both these men are, but why were they in secret? Well, we already answered that question as we read through the verses. Uh, we see there in verse 38 that for fear of the Jews, for fear of the Jews is why they were doing this stuff in secret. Nicodemus, for fear of the Jews, visited Christ at night. That's what he did back in John chapter 3. Those numbered among those who believed in Christ in John 12 for fear of the Jews, they also did not openly confess Jesus as Lord. So what we can take from this, if we're just shooting straight, right, if we just take this for what it is, these are both uh, cowards, right? They're, they're cowardly men in this time. If, if we're just being plain about it, these, are, these, these two men are cowards. Uh, Jesus is the man who would lay down his life for them, but they stood by and let it happen. That's, that's what happened. Now, you may say, man, it's a little harsh, you know, to be like, they're, they're just guys. Like, what did you expect, right? We're on the backside of this. We're able to use hindsight and see just who Jesus was. Like, they didn't have that benefit. Why are you being so harsh on them? Well, I'm not being harsh. I just really want us to understand what a coward is. I mean, it's someone who doesn't stand up for what's right. That, that's being, that's, that's cowardice, right? And I'm not trying to disconnect us or drag them through the mud. That's just what that is. And when I say that, I'm not saying we are any different. We're just like them. We are just like Joseph and Nicodemus. If you really think about it, if you really think on your life, uh, our whole life is lived before the face of God. That's, that's what we are told. God is everywhere. There is nothing hidden from his sight. So all of life is lived before him. If we think about that and we think about the things we do on a daily basis, from the most minuscule details to the biggest things that we do, every decision that we make is only going to be based on two motives. There's only two things that make us do anything in this life. Either our fear of God or our fear of man. That's it. That's the only reason we do anything in this life is because of the fear we have of God or the fear we have of man. Now, you may say, well, come on, man. What about like when I eat, you know, I choose a, a cheeseburger instead of chicken sandwich or I wear blue jeans instead of khakis. Like, it, it can't be that serious like you can't be telling me every little thing has that that much significance well there's two type of categories when we think about these gray areas what are known as adiaphora right if, if you're familiar with that term or if you're not it just means indifferent right there's things that do fall into those categories but that's not what I'm talking about I'm not talking about things that God has commanded things that God has prohibited and then that gray area where he doesn't tell us exactly uh, what he has commanded of us to or not do. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the motive behind the things that we do, the things that we don't do, and then the things that we have wisdom to take into the, to account when we do anything that we do. Listen to what uh, Paul says in Colossians 3 concerning our motivation for anything that we do. This is found in verse 17. He says, and whatever you do in word or deed, whatever you do, right? That's, that's, that's everything. Do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. That's whatever you do. Does that count eating a cheeseburger, tying your shoes, you know, waking up in the morning? All of that. Whatever you do, do in the name of the Lord. Whether I do it in word or in deed, everything should be done in the name of the Lord. This is just another way of saying doing everything out of the fear of God. I either fear God and long to worship and obey him, or I fear man and I long to seek his approval and obey him. It's one or the other. I'm either giving glory to God or I'm giving glory to man. Right? Am I doing this because this is what my kids want, or am I doing this because this is what my spouse wants, this is what my boss wants, or am I doing this because this glorifies God? What is my motivation in anything that I do? This is very crucial for us to understand in the life of a believer. Every thought is to be taken captive and made obedient to Christ. Every thought, right? We don't do anything without thinking. We may think we do things without thinking. Everything we do, we do because there's some motivating factor that's drawn us to make those decisions. And so I say all that to say this is a level playing field between us and Joseph and, and Nicodemus. There's no difference between us and them. 
if you think about it, their lives are recorded in, in the Bible for us to see and to critique and do all that. Our lives typically aren't, right? Not, most of our stuff is not for, uh, for the eyes to be scrutinized, unless you're the type of person that puts everything on Facebook. But if you're not, mostly everything is kind of hidden from the sight of man. We only show each other what we want each other to see. But how much of your Christian life is done in secret, at night, behind closed doors, within these church walls, right? How much of your Christian life is lived that way? There is a phrase that I've heard, and it's, it's an illustration, and all illustrations fall short at some point, but it's something that I do believe we should consider when we think about the way we live our Christian life and the motivation for the things that we do. Uh, and, and the question is this, if you were on trial for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? Right, if you were on trial for being a Christian, if somebody was scrutinizing your every move, would there be enough evidence to convict you? Now, what I am not saying is that we are saved by our own works and, and things like that, that you have to do all these things to be a Christian. I'm not saying that at all, because faith in Christ is what saves us. We are justified by faith, by faith alone in Christ alone, to the glory of God alone. But, and, and that's what Joseph and Nicodemus had. They had this faith in Christ. And they showed it. This is exactly why they stepped up in the moment that they did. But think about the lives of Joseph and Nicodemus. And if they did all this stuff in secret, just how much they missed out on not being a part openly of Christ's ministry this whole time. They missed out on a lot of things for fear of the Jews. Now, something that we have to remember when we go back to our sermon summary is to, to think about these things whether we're disobedient or obedient, God's will will be done. God will work in spite of you, or he will work in light of your obedience. We have to remember that. God will work in spite of you, or he will work in light of your obedience. So these are the, the two men, right? Joseph and Nicodemus. They, they, made, they did these things. That we, this is who they are. This is why they did what they did. Or this is, this is what it meant for them to do these things in secret. Uh, but then they also performed these burial customs, right? They, they did these things uh, that were the customs of the Jews. Now, as we see who they were, let's, let's look at what they did. Uh, so what were the customs? What did they look like? <clears throat> so um, the preparation of a corpse for the, for the Jews would have kind of looked like this. They would have taken this shroud or these linen cloths. They would have sprinkled them with incense or, or spices and it's kind of like a, almost like a bed sheet, for the lack of a better description. Uh, they'd lay them down, and they'd wrap up their body within this, this shroud or this, this, this sheet, and they'd wrap their head up as well. And this is how they would prepare a body for burial. Uh, they did this for Jesus with a mixture of myrrh and aloe. Now, when we think of aloe now, we kind of think of aloe vera and the, the, the gel that comes out of the plant. Uh, but this, the, 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 what's being used here, since these are spices, this is almost like, I don't know if it was dehydrated, but these were two basic powders. The, these were powders that they were using um, to, to create this spice that made this aromatic scent that would try to deodorize or cover the smell of death as the body continued to decompose. Uh, but this is what was going on here. Now, what we see said by Nicod or said of Nicodemus is that he was carrying 75 pounds of this, this mixture of spices. Now, if you read out of the King James, the New King James, the NASB, uh, or the Amplified Bible, I believe, if you're reading along with us, I see a head shaking. It says 100 pounds in that one. And then what I read in the ESV says 75 pounds, right? So I feel like this, this bears mentioning because there's... There's a thought like, whoa, what, why, why is it 75? Is this an error? Is this some kind of uh, misinterpretation or mistranslation here? Is there some kind of inconsistency between these translations? And the answer to that is no. Well, why is that? Well, your Bible may have a footnote or it may not. But the idea here is the word that's used uh, for pound is this uh, Greek word litra, which we think of the word liter, but more so this was the Roman pound. Uh, this is a Greek word for the, the Roman weight that was used at that time. And this weight was weight is a little less than three quarters of a English pound, the pound that we use today, which is 16 ounces. This was a little less than three quarters of a pound. So if we're using, um, I just, I had the word this morning, I lost it because I didn't write it down. But anyways, if you're converting 
Roman pounds to English pounds, you're going to go from 100 to 75. Three quarters, right, equals 75. And so that's the idea. The King James, New King James, NASB, these are referencing the literal word of pound, the Roman pound. Uh, and I believe the Amplified Version, if anybody has it, I think it says 100 Roman pounds in it. Uh, but if you're reading the ESV, it's converted that, that word to the English uh, rendering of this word pound. So it's, it's, it's more, I guess, palatable for us as English readers to know what they're talking about when it's saying pounds. So there's that. That's the, that's the difference that we have here. It's just 100 Roman pounds equals roughly 75 English pounds. Either way, it's a lot of weight. There's a lot of spices, right? If you think about the average Palestinian Jew of this time, these men were roughly, they were thought to be about five foot five. They weren't huge men. They had a diet primarily of vegetables and grains, uh, fish, uh, not a whole lot of meats like we do down here, not a lot of stuff that's fried. Uh, so their weight wasn't quite what we have here, right? You think of the average man here, uh, we're none, you know, there's very few of us that are around that size and, that, and, and 130, 130, 140 pounds. Uh, but if you think about this, 75 pounds is a lot of weight, right? That's, that's a lot of, of sacks of spices to carry around, right? Uh, this would be about half the weight of a, of a man in spices that are going to be used. So what is the significance there? Well, the idea is that as these men, you know, as if you thought about your average run-of-the-mill Jew, he wouldn't have 75 pounds of spices just lying around. Uh, so they're going to sprinkle what they can on the body, maybe ounces, maybe pounds, uh, to, to try to coat the, the body and, and prevent the scent. So what this is letting us know and what we see through history, through recorded history, is that the more weight that was used to surround this body, uh, it signified the, the, uh, the honor given to the person that was being uh, buried. Uh, there's a reference in, I believe it's in Second Chronicles 16, I didn't write it down, but uh, where one of the king, I believe it was King Asa, whenever he died, he was buried with, uh, I forget how many pounds, let's say 50, 60 pounds of, of spices that he was buried with, uh, and they buried him on top of it, right? They had this bed of the spices that he was buried with. Uh, Gamaliel, who was Paul's teacher, uh, it's recorded, and I believe this is by Josephus, it's recorded in the first century that when he was buried, or yeah, when he was buried, they, they uh, anointed his body with 80 pounds of spices. And so this, this idea, he was known as one of the greatest teachers in Jewish history. Uh, so it kind of lets you know the idea of the weight, um, pun intended, behind Jesus having all, this, um, all these spices being that he's buried with. So the big takeaway here, right, regardless of the exact percentage or the exact weight of the, of the spices that he has, the big takeaway for us is the care, respect, the honor, and the links these men went to to ensure Jesus was given the best burial that money could buy. Right? This is a, a beautiful thing to consider, the, the care that is shown for Jesus in his death. Right? Not just in his life, not just throughout all these other things, but in his death we see this, this picture of care and concern shown for his body. So not, another thing to consider with this as we think about the burial customs of the Jews of this day is this was rushed and this was done right before the Sabbath. And according to what we see in uh, Numbers 19, verse 11, any time a Jew came in contact with a corpse, with a dead body, he would be ceremonially unclean for seven days. Right? This would prevent Joseph and Nicodemus from entering the synagogue the following day to worship God, right? Them burying Jesus, touching his body would prevent them access to God in, in, their, in their form of worship on the Sabbath day. Uh, but what we see here also, it's an amazing thing that these men being guided by the spirit compelled to do these acts for God, they disregarded this ceremonial law that pointed to Christ in order to fulfill the things they felt necessary uh, to, to honor Christ in his body in his death. Uh, I, I find that very fascinating. Seeing the spirit of the law in play versus the letter of the law is, is, a, is a wonderful thing here. Now, when we think about all these things we've already talked about with Joseph and Nicodemus, their cowardice, uh, their, their convictions that they have, I, I view this for us as a mirror into our own lives. Uh, maybe you're better than me, uh, but if we are all on the same page, I think a lot of our lives are lived 
in fear and in courage. Like we kind of, it's kind of like this roller coaster of, of emotions where we go through at times we're fearful of man. And then in times we step out in faith and encourage and do the things that God has called us to do. But both of these things are in full display in the lives of Joseph and Nicodemus. So let's go ahead and move on to our next point. The next point that we have is we're talking about this garden tomb where his body was buried and its significance. We're going to see this in verses 41 and 42. Now here we get to see where his body was buried, the significance that it plays and and how this kind of plays out for us today, what it means for us. So something uh, that's mentioned here in John's gospel that's not mentioned in the other gospel accounts is the fact that his tomb was in, in the middle of a garden, or maybe not quite in the middle, but it was in a garden, right? His, his tomb was in a garden. We see further evidence of this, that it wasn't just some, you know, three rose bushes and, and a couple of plants uh, by what we see John mentioned in chapter 20, verse 15, when after the resurrection, Jesus comes to Mary and he's trying to speak to her. She doesn't look up. She's crying. Excuse me. And she assumes that he's the gardener. Right? She assumes that he's the gardener. Well, why would you need a gardener if it was just a little bitty area? Right? There's, this is obviously a full-on garden that we have here. We don't know the size of it, but there's a tomb in the midst of this garden. So with that in mind, I, I, I ask the question, well, what, if any, is the significance of the garden? Right? When we think about what Jesus being buried here in this tomb, is there any significance in a garden? Well, I guess if you think about it, right, if we think about Jesus being buried in a garden and we look back all the way back to Genesis, it all started in a garden, right? It it all started in a garden. There was a quote that I heard and I I failed to get the guy's name, but it's simple, but I can't take credit for it. It, it, he, He said this, in a garden, man fell and in a garden, man was redeemed, right? This is a beautiful picture that we see understanding where Jesus was buried in this garden, right? The fact that man fell, uh, this was the dwelling place of God, the original garden where Adam and Eve were. This was, this was the, dwelling, the original dwelling place of God and man and would be in a garden tomb where his, the body of death would be buried and raised to newness of life, showing God's power, conquering sin and death. Right. Amen. It's a beautiful thing to see. Like when we think about it, like that's 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 awesome. Like the connections that God makes through his word for us to see just how intricate the details are uh, in his redemption of mankind. Now, when we think about a garden, just for illustration's sake, if, if I was to tell you, draw a picture of a garden or what is a how does a garden make you feel if you were going to a garden? What are your initial thoughts? Well, Some of the things you may think are, well, it's peaceful, uh, it's well-kept, life is thriving. Some people go to gardens to to work the ground, to try to, you know, clear their mind, right? We kind of think of these things as like pleasant thoughts. There's wonderful aromas when the flowers are blooming. Uh, You may have fruit in your garden that you can pluck and eat, and you kind of think of uh, just life at its fullest, right, when you think of a garden. Uh, now, that, that's the picture that I like to think of when I think about this garden. There's life all around death, right? But then life comes out of death, and, and we get this picture uh, of God's grace and power. It, it's, a, it's a wonderful thing. Like I said, there's tons of application here that we can fall into and things we can look into, but we don't quite have the time, so we're going to keep moving. So what else do we have here, right? We're, we talked about the garden briefly. Let's look at the tomb. Now, here we are told that it's, it's, a, it's a new tomb. It's freshly cut out of stone. Um, and so this was prepared by Joseph, potentially at a later date for himself. Uh, but considering Jesus died around 3 o'clock, the Sabbath day uh, started that evening at sundown. By the time he requested the body, they verified that Jesus was dead. He came back to tell them that he was dead. They grabbed the body. They prepared it. Time's ticking away, right? So they're kind of rushing to get Jesus' body prepared. That way they don't do any work on the Sabbath, right? This, this was a small window that they had to work within to prepare the body of Jesus. But in the midst of all of that, providentially, there was, there was this brand new tomb in a garden right next to the crucifixion site. So all this stuff kind of just played out perfectly where they didn't have to rush him miles away or, you know, a uh, long distance away, it was right there. They were able to prepare him and put him in this tomb. And this tomb was prepared 
by a rich man, so it was fit for a rich man. Now listen to how Isaiah describes what's going on here in in, uh, his chapter on the suffering servant, Isaiah 53. This is a chapter we're all familiar with, right? He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities and by his stripes we are healed. All that's mentioned in in Isaiah 53. But listen to what it says in verse 9. It says, And they made his grave with the wicked and with the rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. All right, Jesus died between two thieves, and then he was laid to rest with the rich man. Right, we, We see this being played out right here in these verses before us today. 75 pounds of spices covered his body. He's wrapped in a shroud and placed in a fresh tomb fit for a king. Now, what else is significant about this tomb, right, that we can talk about today? Well, this tomb served as part of the sign Jesus prophesied earlier in his ministry when talking about Jonah when he was speaking to the Pharisees. Now, we briefly covered this during our Bible study But I want to read uh, from this account where Jesus prophesied about this. This is in Matthew chapter 12, verses 38 through 41. Listen to what it says. It says this. Then some of the scribes and Pharisees answered him, saying, Teacher, we wish to see a sign from you. But he answered them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment of this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, something greater than Jonah is here. It's a, that, yeah, I love that. So what's the significance of this tomb? Right, this is ground zero for the resurrection for the sign of Jonah, right? Jesus is the greater Jonah. That's what Jesus said himself. He is the greater Jonah. This is ground zero. This is where everything takes place. Death, sin, and Satan will be defeated foes as Christ our King rises in incorruptible flesh. That's something we should be saying amen about, right? I mean, this is, this is beautiful, right? This is, this is a wonderful thing. Now, as we kind of wrap up what we're talking about with with the man in the tomb and and these verses what we see here these secretive cowardly men were empowered by God to fulfill the last steps needed in order to bring about the fullness of God's plan of redemption to completion now when Jesus said it is finished he meant it he had completed his task but moving in the hearts of men God led these men in boldness to acquire the body days previously to prepare and pay and construct a new tomb, gather these spices, and then prepare the body for burial and bury him. All of this stuff took place to fulfill all righteousness. Now, this is something that I've said many a times if we've ever had a conversation about how things just work out right sometimes, Uh, but it's just, it's funny when we read this stuff and, and how people deny the power of God, these things, the way they play out in light of scripture, it's just, it's too coincidental to be pure coincidence, right? There's too much being orchestrated and playing together for this to just be mere chance, mere coincidence, right? All of this stuff working together is is working out too perfectly. So as we think about this, right, this should further affirm our faith in Christ as we see these things playing out just as God had predicted them through the Old Testament, just as God predicted uh, them through his ministry, uh, and then as we see them fulfilled in his death, in his burial, and then we'll see later on in his resurrection. So as we know all of these things, what does this mean for you, right? I'm giving you a bunch of stuff. What does this mean for me, right? That, that's kind of the idea that, that you would ask, right? What should be the ultimate takeaway from our passage today? Well, one of the things that I see that, that I, I can see as being beneficial for us as an application to kind of walk with, to be encouraged by, is the fact that the perseverance of the saints is guided by God's providence, right? As we persevere in the faith, it is God's providence, his leading, his guiding, his providing for us in this life that we will persevere. Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus are prime examples of Christians today. Right, on one hand, you can say that in spite of their worst efforts, them being fearful of the Jews, kind of doing everything in secret, right, all these things that they'd done, that God's will still prevailed. These were cowards for most of Christ's ministry here on life, uh, in life. 
Uh, They were scared and they enjoyed their place in the synagogue and amongst the council. But it wasn't until they saw for themselves the lengths Christ would go for their salvation that they were emboldened to step up and do what they were called to do in obedience to Christ. Now, oftentimes, that's what it takes for us, right? We, we live this life, we get comfortable, we get complacent, and we just kind of coast. Then we're reminded of the gospel of Jesus Christ and all that he's done for us, and it's encouraging for us to step out in faith, step out in boldness, in confidence, and do all the things that he's called us to do. And that's what Christ does for his people, right? Christ is not a motivational speaker that's just trying to uh, gas us up and, and get us moving down the road. Christ brings conviction. That's what he does for his people. He gives us conviction. And I don't know if we ever truly think about that. Repentance and conviction, they go hand in hand. And true conviction is, is just that, right? It's, 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 it's not that we won't make mistakes in this life. It's that that fall is just a little less, right? As we repent of our sins, God is building us up in our faith. And as we fall, that, that rock bottom feeling that we get to is just a little less deep than it was the last time. I don't know if you can attest to that in your own life, but uh, for my own life, I could say, yeah, like there's times where it seemed like it was the end of the world and there was no hope. But as we grow in our faith, God, that, that conviction that he gives us as we fall, we're not building ourselves up as much as we used to. So that fall isn't as hard. That, that base level of conviction that we have is growing within us. As we humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God, he exalts us and he makes us stand firm. And so I think as we think about that, there's something that we must take into consideration and live in light of is that there is no greater place to be than in the will of the Lord. Right? There is no greater place for us to be than in the walking in the will of the Lord. It may not be the safest, you know, if we're thinking in human terms, uh, but it is the best place that we could be. In his presence, there is fullness of joy. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom, pure, blessed freedom. And you won't find it anywhere else. Now, if you're the type that feels like you have lost that desire, that that conviction to follow Christ as he has called you to, think about what he has done for you in his death, in his burial, and in his resurrection. You must get in his word, get on your knees, spend time with him, repent, believe this gospel of Jesus Christ, because there is no other way. Jesus came to set the captives free, and he came to seek and save the lost. If that is you, run to him. Don't waste another moment. Cling to him and rest in him. You won't find rest anywhere else. You won't find peace anywhere else. It is in him and in him alone. Now, as our music team comes forward, we will now have our time of reflection. Uh, In this time, we ask that as the song plays, you spend some time in prayer, reflecting on what you've heard today. Um, Feel free, once once you're, you're, you're done spending that time in prayer, to stand up and sing with us. If you'd like someone to pray with you, we can pray with you. Pray with your family at your seat. Do whatever you feel led by the Lord to do in this time. But um, as they sing this song, let's use this time uh, for, for just that. Uh, let, me, let me go ahead and pray for us before we get in there. Give them a second just to get set up. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for what you have done for us, what you continue to do. You have provided your son, and you have shown us specifically today in his burial that our sins were buried with him, that you are fulfilling all the things that you have said you would do in this time. We just pray, Lord, that we are able to walk in obedience to you. For you have called us, you have purchased us with a price, for we are not our own. Lord, help us to see these things in this way. Help us to spend time in reflection now, uh, resting in your grace and walking in obedience. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Oh 
church as we um, do our doxology and we are closing out our service um, you can bring your offering up as that is played um, but yeah I, I forgot to mention it this morning uh, Santiago uh, which is Koki and Hopi's dad he also was diagnosed with COVID so let's be praying for him and, and that household uh, so far Koki and Bonnie tested negative um, but I'm not sure about JJ he was the other one in that household so I uh, let's be praying for them. He's 99, and uh, so it's it's a little way more riskier for him to get it than some of us who are, are um, less in age. But yeah, let's let's keep them in prayer. Like I said, you can stand as we sing this final song, and if you have an offering to bring forward, go ahead and bring it forward. God bless. Praise and glory to the Father. Praise and glory to the Son. And glory to the Spirit, ever free and ever one. Praise and glory to the Father, praise and glory to the Son, praise and glory to the Spirit. 